Uh, hello, all. Let me get set up here. My name is J.B. Anderson, for those of you who are new and uh, welcome. And welcome to the rest of you. Uh, thanks for signing up again this quarter. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about Thomas Jefferson's uh, second term as president uh, beginning today. Uh, and we'll have a variety of other topics also. Uh, his vice president was Aaron Burr, pictured here in a <clears throat> drawing. Uh, in 1804, Burr chose not to run again. Vice presidents uh, were not running separately. Uh, they were running on the presidential ticket. Whoever got the most votes was president. Whoever got the second most, and it might be somebody from a different party, would be vice president. Uh, well, Burr chose not to run again, or, or ran, got, he forgot about that option, said the heck with it. And he decided he'd run for governor of New York instead. He lost that election. Uh, here's sign language for loser. Uh, so the Democrats, uh, the party existed at this time. It's the oldest party. Republicans were not founded until 1854. Uh, Jefferson's running for a second term, and it's uh, <clears throat> kind of agreed to that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> allergies. Uh, George Clinton, who uh, uh, was a uh, leading Democrat at the time, it was decided between Jefferson and Clinton that Clinton uh, would hopefully be the runner-up and then would uh, claim himself to be vice president. Uh, the Federalist Party, which was in opposition to the Democrats at this time, ran Charles Pickney, who's pictured here. He's uh, got quite a record. He's a founding father. He signed the U.S. Constitution. He uh, served as governor of uh, South Carolina, a southern slave state. He was a slave owner, owning about 250 slaves. And he was a brigadier general in the United States Army. Now, Jefferson won big time in the Electoral College, 162 to 14 electoral votes. In the popular vote, incredible margin, uh, 104,000 votes to 39,000 votes. 73% of the total popular vote went to Jefferson. Pickney won uh, three states, Connecticut with nine votes, Delaware with three votes, and Maryland, Maryland had more than two votes, <clears throat> but they divided their votes based on the popular vote. So uh, Maryland uh, divides their electoral votes. Pickney got two of those. Um, let's take a look at uh, popular vote wins in U.S. history by percentage. George Washington ran twice for president. He was unopposed both times and uh, uh, got 100% of the vote as a result. Uh, and I, I've got a wrong date there. It should be 1792 was that second election. Uh, Jefferson, 72.79%. Monroe, 68. Madison, 1808, uh, almost 65%. Then we jump way forward, 100, uh, over 150 years, 156 years forward before we get a major margin in popular vote totals again. And uh, this uh, chart that I've created here is all of the popular vote totals in U.S. history that have been higher than 60%. 
Lyndon Johnson in 1964 got 61% of the vote. And uh, uh, Gold, uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 got 60.8%. Uh, Nixon in 72 got 60.67% and then was forced into resignation. And uh, Warren Harding in the 1920 election got 60.32% of the vote. So you can see there's uh, this uh, really for people, for presidents who ran in opposition to somebody else, Jefferson is the all time winner for uh, popular vote percentage at nearly 73%. Uh, Democratic infighting during that second term of Jefferson's, which was 1805 to 1809. Let's take a look at the difficulties. Uh, basically, uh, Within the Democratic Party, it, the issue was uh, states' rights versus federal power. And should the federal government have a good deal of power or should states be the leading power uh, in the uh, United States? And, and uh, most Democrats wanted a weak federal government. Now, most people go, what? Because they're just the opposite today. The party switched became quite a different party than it started out as. And the uh, Republican Party uh, picked up the weak federal government after its founding in 1854. Uh, Federalists wanted a strong federal government. So you got the Democratic Party, uh, states' rights, and the Federalist Party at the time of Jefferson, they want a strong federal government. And we can talk about some of the things that uh, are make a federal government strong, et cetera. At any rate, uh, both parties uh, here talking about Republicans and Democrats have changed. Democrats have gone to largely a people support and a federal government support. Republicans uh, tend to be very interested in corporate support and states' rights support in the modern world. Three major issues for Jefferson and the Democrats. First one is a weak federal government, but Jefferson flies in the face of this. He's interested in acquiring this territory that's owned by France at the time, and uh, it becomes the Louisiana Purchase. Most Democrats don't like this. Why are we involved in all this expansionism? Why is the federal government doing it? And uh, Florida is also a part of this. Florida's uh, but doesn't become a part of the U.S. yet, but um, there's talk about uh, acquiring Florida in addition to Louisiana. That happens later. Uh, Louisiana Purchase is really is a super big deal. Of the 50 states, about 13 and a half of the 50 states are located, and that's like about a little more than a fourth, are located within the Louisiana Purchase. Now, at the time of the purchase, there were 17 states. That was 1803. This area became 44% of all the states. So Jefferson, also another thing he tries to do is influence Congress. A lot of people thought president is a separate branch, Congress is a separate branch, the, the judiciary is a separate branch. You leave them all alone. And uh, uh, Jefferson now is starting to make comments to Congress about what they should do. Here's a recent uh, political cartoon uh, from the Minneapolis Star and Tribune. 
And there's a politician in the, in the blue coat on the left saying, must obey, he's pointing both barrels at me. And it's the National Rifle Association with a couple barrels full of money. Uh, but the cartoon, it speaks to uh, the, the federal government, what it should be doing, who it should be talking to. And uh, our politicians mostly uh, tied in with uh, corporations or uh, big name organizations that have a political agenda of some sort. Uh, attempts to influence Congress by Jefferson uh, were frowned on by uh, the other Democrats within his party. They thought that was uh, way out of line. Uh, annual State of the Union message that's delivered by a president uh, now proposes new legislation. The president goes to Congress uh, every year in January, usually in January. Uh, Reagan delayed it several times, uh, didn't deliver until February or March. And, and uh, in, another interesting thing about the uh, State of the Union message uh, with Jefferson here is uh, uh, speaking it to Congress or just sending them a message and we'll have... Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, Jefferson had a stutter and uh, didn't like speaking in public as a result. So instead of going to Congress, as George Washington and John Adams did and delivering a speech, he just sent them a written message. And uh, presidents continued to do that until 1913, when uh, Woodrow Wilson broke the pattern and began speaking it again. And since 1913, no, presidents have verbally delivered the State of the Union message. Uh, it originated in the Constitution, and we're going to take a look at the at part of the Constitution. It's Article 2, Section 3, Clause 1. You can follow along with me here shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. So there is a constitutional uh, uh, section here that uh, says the president may deal with uh, Congress may talk to Congress about what they should be doing. So Jefferson's uh, enemies within his own party were really uh, kind of anti-constitutional. Third major issue for Jefferson and the Democrats was uh, money. Uh, $20 million budget, about $400 million in 2020, Dollars, and that's measured by inflation. Uh, and that money is to be used to build roads and canals. And Democrats are outraged that Jefferson would propose such a thing. It is a state and local responsibility. Of course, the problem that you'd run into is you build a road and then it ends at your border and the next state builds a road and it ends 10 miles further north, and there's no road joining them. So there's no national planning. And uh, that was one of the things uh, Jefferson was uh, concerned about. And the same thing with canals. You know, canals are very expensive to build. Uh, canals would be built between two rivers, so you could sail one river for a ways, and then there might be a 10 mile long canal that would take you to another river. And uh, that was a major form of distribution in the early 1800s was waterways. So anyway, uh, the argument, uh, the third major issue between Jefferson and the Democrats is who should control or build 
transportation within the United States. So Democrats were heavily states' rights, supported a weak federal government. This is the early 1800s, and here's the a democratic symbol for a for weakness. In the 20th century, uh, political scientists say we've actually had four political parties, not two. <laughs> One is Northern Democrats, who tend to be more liberal. <clears throat> Southern Democrats, who are uh, more conservative on the conservative side. Then you got Northeast Republicans who are liberal, and you've got Western Republicans out in the prairie states, and they are conservative, mostly. There was a period of time when these uh, Western agricultural states were electing people within the Republican Party that came to be called progressives, and that was for a short period of time. So when you think about the 20th century, you know, uh, 1901 to 2001, you should think about Northern and Southern Democrats, Northeast and Western Republicans. And these were really four political parties. The most famous separation probably among the Democrats was the 1948 convention <clears throat> where Hubert Humphrey made a speech calling for equal rights for people of color, and the Southern delegation of the Democratic Party got up and walked out. And they formed a third party in that election called the Dixiecrats. Uh, it was during Jefferson's presidency that the most famous duel in U.S. history occurred, and it was between uh, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. <clears throat> and we're going to have several categories here. First is introduction. There were charges about sexual misconduct uh, by Burr, and the charges came uh, from Hamilton and from others. And uh, they involved, uh, at least in one case, Burr's daughter. And there was talk about uh, closeness, the closeness that Burr had with his daughter, Theodosia, <clears throat> which, if it was sexual in nature, would be incest. On the uh, left here is Aaron Burr, and this is his daughter, Theodosia. Uh, she was uh, traveling in the Atlantic Ocean up the coast of uh, the United States and the boat disappeared. Uh, and uh, it was assumed, of course, that she was killed in that. But uh, all of this uh, made for a lot of anger between Hamilton and Burr. Uh, the actual fact is uh, Burr was having lots of affairs. Many historians believe that he had an affair with Martin Van Buren's mother when she was married and that uh, he is indeed the father of Martin Van Buren, who was the eighth president of the United States. And here's Burr in the top drawing and uh, Aaron Burr at the bottom in a painting. So we should call him Martin Van Burr and maybe. Uh, there's no scientific proof of fatherhood, uh, but there's five items of interest that point in the direction that uh, he was the father, that Burr was the father of Van Buren. <laughs> John Quin Quincy Adams kept what is probably the greatest diary in human history. For a period of 40 years, he wrote in it daily. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, bunch of comments uh, and lots of stuff. And uh, he wrote about uh, this 
conflict between uh, Burr and Hamilton and all the talk about uh, Burr being um, quite um, the roundabout fellow sexually and the charges concerning his fatherhood of Martin Van Buren. There is a physical resemblance, secondly. So we've got uh, we've got uh, John Quincy Adams writing about this and saying that, hey, it looks like a real thing. Here is uh, the two pictures of Burr and Van Buren. And uh, most people say that there is definitely a resemblance. The mouth is very similar, uh, the cheek line, here are these cheek lines, the mouth, and the nose. A third item. <clears throat> Burr was unmarried uh, much of his life, from age 38 to 77. Uh, the odds of him being involved with other women, historians say, as a result of this long period of widowerhood, uh, is highly likely. Uh, he was divorced from his second wife at the age of 38 years, and the charge against him by her was infidelity. So he, even during his marriages, he was uh, <coughs> playing around with other women. Uh, not an uncommon thing, but uh, at least we have evidence that uh, that was the case. Burr also had two young men that lived with him. The assumption is these were his illegitimate sons, and he took them in uh, in order to uh, get them educated and started into a uh, profession of some sort. So this uh, this whole business about uh, Burr's uh, sexuality and the comments uh, made by Hamilton lead up to a duel, the Hamilton-Burr duel of 1804. Uh, here, this is Manhattan. <clears throat> this is the Times Square area. My wife had a good friend that she grew up with in a small town of 4,000 people who lived right near this area and worked on Broadway for 35 years. And here you just, you can see, you just go straight across the river from Times Square and you have Weehawken, New Jersey. Now in, in New York, uh, in the state of New York, dueling, had been declared illegal. But in New Jersey, dueling was legal. And the dueling site was located at Weehawken. In this, it was actually in this area, coastal area along there. And uh, uh, there are lots of duels ended up taking place at this area as a result. Uh, many say the witnesses said uh, <clears throat> Hamilton lifted his gun straight up into the air and pulled the trigger, did not aim it at Burr, or did not shoot at Burr. Burr then had uh, lots of time to take aim, uh, make sure he had a good shot, accurate shot, and uh, was able to strike Hamilton. Here's a drawing of their duel. Uh, this was uh, the first time, now, uh, uh, Burr was vice president of the United States. This is the first time a vice president had shot anyone. Second time was Dick Cheney and his hunting partner. Hunting partners pictured here. Here's Cheney. Here they are looking over a gun, et cetera. Remember that, I suspect. Uh, Weehawken Dueling Grounds, this is a picture of the plaque at that area. And uh, during the 1700s and up into the 1840s, <clears throat> somewhere below this site, 
on a wooded ledge 20 feet above the Hudson River lay the dueling grounds. Among the many known and unknown duelists who fought here were Governor of New York, DeWitt Clinton, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, Vice President Aaron Burr, U.S. Navy Commodore Oliver Perry, all came to Weehawken to defend their honor according to the custom of the day. And this is, was erected there in 2004 on the 200th anniversary of the Hamilton and Burr duel. <clears throat> Hamilton died uh, hours later. He was uh, taken back to his home. And he's buried at Trinity Church, which is in Lower Manhattan. I've walked past this church, but I couldn't get into it. The gate was locked. Well, this church uh, has a, a cemetery. This is Alexander Hamilton's burial site within the grounds of Trinity Church. And uh, you can see it's there it says Alexander Hamilton. And it has comments about Hamilton. People place flags in a pot there. And you can see there is um, a regular growth of flowers around the edge. And also, you know, this is a 220 year old burial site, but look at this crack along here. Someday somebody might pay to get it repaired. <clears throat> Kind of a side note here, this is a diversion. <clears throat> also buried at Trinity Church is Alfred Tennyson Dickens. He's the son of Charles Dickens, lived from 1845 to 1912. Um, uh, the, the diversion deals with uh, something personal. I got a $2,000 advance on a book that I wrote in 1979. And uh, my wife and I, both uh, involved in education, said, uh, let's go spend the summer in New York City. And I had uh, friends, I had some former students in New York City. Uh, they were going to be gone for a week, so we'd rent their apartment for a week. Uh, if they were paying 40 bucks a day, 1200 bucks a month rent, I said, okay, I'll give you 40 bucks a day. And we managed to stay six weeks in a variety of different uh, uh, places. But my wife said, um, you ought to take 10% of that $2,000 advance and buy something that you're always going to have. So I had 200 bucks to spend. <clears throat> we went up to my wife's friend, Judy, uh, her apartment there just off of Times Square. And uh, there were some people that lived, uh, she was on the 44th floor. There were some people that lived on the 44th floor with her that said, hey, We'd like to talk to that couple. And they showed us their apartment. And um, in his office space, he had an autograph of Andre Gide, a French novelist. I said, where'd you get that? I said, that'd be an interesting thing for me to buy. I'm thinking about my 200 bucks and, uh, you know, some kind of autograph. And he said, oh, there's here in Manhattan, there's half a dozen auction houses. <clears throat> so I looked in the phone book. Yep, we had phone books back then. And I found a place and I went to it. And the guy said, I'm having an auction at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel this Thursday. And it was like a Monday or Tuesday I was there. So I went to the auction. And here's the Waldorf Astoria Big fancy place, pretty interesting spot. Uh, Herbert Hoover lived here after his presidency. <laughs> there was a doorman here who collected autographs, and that's what I was interested in buying. Uh, when the the doorman would, there'd be all sorts of famous people, movie, movie stars, politicians, etc., and uh, they would come there and he would ask for their autographs. And uh, 
when he retired back in the 1980s, uh, they put out a huge uh, autograph sale. I was getting mailings now back here in the Twin Cities to buy autographs. This guy's uh, set of autographs sold for $400,000. Big amount of money in the 1980s. Uh, he asked Herbert Hoover for his autograph and Hoover refused. So he, ne he never got an autograph of Herbert Hoover's and the guy uh, wrote that Hoover really was personally level. He was a real turd. Well, I spent $80 and I got a handwritten letter of Charles Dickens, which relates to this burial at Trinity Church. I had it framed. Here it is. And uh, I found a painting, uh, you know, a print of Dickens. And uh, there's the letter. And uh, the contents about refusing a meeting. He's out of town. The letter that he wrote it on has Gads Hill uh, printed across the top. That was a home outside of London that Dickens had. And uh, and I didn't do much with it. I got a, I paid the 80 bucks, got it framed, and people think it's interesting. But then about 2010, I would regularly watch Antiques Roadshow. There's a woman comes on. She's got a letter similar to mine. It's about, re I'm sorry, I'm up at my Gads Hill estate. I can't come to your party Friday night. It's re He's refusing an invitation. Same kind of content as mine. Uh, the guy evaluating it said $12,000. <laughs> what? I paid 80 bucks for this thing back in 1979. And then he said, if the letter, uh, sometimes Dickens would sign his name and he'd put lines underneath it. Yours, he's, he told this woman, yours doesn't have the lines. If it had the lines, it'd be worth $16,000. Mine has the lines called a seraph. Okay, back to reality. Uh, Burr's Western Empire. And we're going to talk here what Aaron Burr did uh, concerning Louisiana Purchase. And this is a big split over Burr and Jefferson. So J and B, that's not me, that's Jefferson and Burr. They split. Uh, in, they get tied in the Electoral College. Uh, it was agreed in advance that Burr would accept the vice presidency. Uh, Burr backed out of the agreement. Uh, the election uh, of 1801 ended up going into the House of Representatives where it was decided. Uh, Hamilton doesn't like Jefferson. Uh, Hamilton is a Federalist. Uh, he wants a strong federal government. Jefferson doesn't. Uh, Hamilton uh, uh, has got some power in the House of Representatives. He says uh, to his people, let's support Jefferson. I don't like the guy, but Burr is even worse. He's the lesser of two evils. So it's Hamilton that ends up getting Jefferson elected as president, amazingly. So Burr has now been tarnished uh, twice. He doesn't accept the gentleman's agreement about who would be president in 1801 and who would be vice president. And he's had a duel with Hamilton. And of course, there's the uh, sexual charges against him, but uh, just talk on the politics here. Uh, the duel comes about. <clears throat> Now let's talk about uh, the Western Empire and New England secession. Uh, this is New England. You can see it's made up of a half a dozen states here, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Uh, and they want to secede. Uh, they don't like what's going on in the other seven states. Uh, 
Burr supports the secession and then he loses the presidency. So then these states go, oh, well, the heck with it. Our guy didn't get into the White House. So the whole secession movement for the New England states uh, goes away. Louisiana Territory. Burr wants Louisiana for himself. At least this is what uh, the vast majority of historians have agreed to. Uh, and uh, Burr calls it not the Louisiana Purchase, but the Western Empire. And uh, he's going to make it into a separate nation. And it's a gigantic chunk of property. Uh, Burr contacts the British. Uh, he tells them, uh, this is uh, your chance to keep the United States from expanding. But, uh, and I'm the guy that can aid you in that. I need your help. And uh, he waits for their reply. Here's a coin because, of course, the, from 1804. But what, he, what Burr wants is money. Uh, he also wants an army. This is James Wilkinson. He was appointed by Jefferson <clears throat> to be the governor of the new Louisiana Territory. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's an army general. <clears throat> wants a separate Western Empire also. But of course, he keeps us quiet from Jefferson. So Burr becomes a person of interest. <clears throat> Aaron Burr heads out to Louisiana Territory, where he's going to foment a revolution. And he stops in West Virginia on the Ohio River at Blenderhassett Island, which is pictured here, a modern picture of it. It's all greenery. Uh, there it is. Uh, the Blenderhassett family, this is their mansion. Uh, they give, uh, Burr tells him about his plans. They give him $50,000. That's about $1.3 million by inflation in 2023. Head of the family is Harmon Blender Hassett, uh, who you see here on the left, this fellow. Burr gathers 60 men on his uh, trip out toward uh, the Louisiana Purchase Area, or what he's calling the Western Empire. He navigates down the Ohio River here, where it joins up with the Mississippi River, takes the Mississippi River down to New Orleans here. This map really shows you the importance of the Mississippi River. Uh, uh, in the Midwest area. Look at the Missouri River empties into it, the Ohio River. It's a main thoroughfare. This whole Louisiana purchase is stunning simply because of the access that it would give to the United States into all these areas by river. Uh, James Wilkinson is now aiding Burr, even though <clears throat> he's a Jefferson appointee. Then he goes, okay, I'm going to work both sides here. So he contacts Jefferson and says to Jefferson, hey, Burr's out here and he's trying to form a new nation. Uh, and uh, he's uh, looking for support and he's currently in McIntosh, Alabama. Uh, Jefferson has him arrested there. Now, from uh, this southwestern uh, portion of Alabama, under arrest, Burr is taken 860 miles back to Virginia and uh, uh, into the Richmond, Virginia area. He stands trial there. The charges are treason. He denies these charges, said this is foolish and ridiculous, leave me alone, etc. Let's look at the trial of Aaron Burr. 
uh, the presiding uh, uh, chief uh, justice of the Supreme Court pictured here is John Marshall. And he's an opponent to Jefferson. <clears throat> he thought the charges against Burr were way too serious. And he wanted them uh, hammered down. There's a total of, uh, so he throws out these treason charges and there's a bunch of lesser charges that are really at the misdemeanor level. There's a three month trial on these lesser charges. This is a very lengthy trial, uh, high misdemeanors. Uh, he took troops into the area and that threatened Spanish territory. This is one of the charges. You threaten Spanish territory and the US could easily be blamed for this. And as a result, you got a war between Spain and the United States. Let's take a look at this map in greater detail. <clears throat> Here's New Spain. They also own Florida over here. And look, we conquered all this territory all the way down to here uh, in um, the War of 1845, the Mexican-American War. But see, this border isn't determined. And look at this narrow little space here between Spanish uh, territory north of Mexico and Spanish territory in present day Florida. So where's the border? Well, <clears throat> the prosecutor in the trial is this gentleman, George Hay. He brings in 140 witnesses against Burr, tremendous amount of uh, witnesses. Uh, he was a judge. Uh, he's a future husband. About a year after the trial ends, he marries Elisa Monroe, who is the daughter of the future president, uh, James Monroe. So Jefferson sends Hay a bunch of blank pardons. All these 140 people who are testifying, if any of them say anything that incriminates themselves, you are to give them this pardon because they're testifying against a guy guilty of, uh, and, you know, incredibly high crimes, trying to take over U.S. purchase territory. Um, uh, and uh, if they say, I can't testify against Burr, then you tell them, yeah, yes, you can here. I'll give you, a, here's a pardon. So anything you say, so you're, you're building up a tremendous uh, group of people to testify against Aaron Burr. Uh, one guy testified <clears throat> that uh, he was a secretary to Aaron Burr and he created a document for Burr. And uh, the document indicated that Burr would be attempting to take over Louisiana territory. <clears throat> uh, Jefferson was called to testify uh, against Burr and he refused. He claimed the defense uh, team had all the federal information they needed. You've got all kinds of papers uh, and accusations against Burr and what he was doing in Louisiana territory. You don't need my testimony. <clears throat> uh, Jefferson claimed executive privilege. He said, I'm exempt from testifying. <clears throat> this is the second time in US history that a president has said, no, I don't have to testify in a court because I have executive privilege. So let's do a little diversion here. Executive privilege in history. Uh, George Washington was the first uh, to do this. He did it once. There were wars being waged against Native American societies uh, uh, in the western, uh, to the west of the United States, Congress wanted information from Washington on these uh, 
battles that were occurring with Native Americans, and Washington refused to give them that information, claiming it's top secret and that he has executive privilege. Then Jefferson made one uh, claim of executive privilege, and that was not to testify about the Louisiana Purchase in the Burr trial. Then we go 150 years up to Eisenhower, no claims of executive privilege. Eisenhower uh, had cabinet members that he said, you don't have to testify before this Joe McCarthy guy. Uh, Joe McCarthy <clears throat> was this ferocious anti-communist in the late 1940s and into the 1950s and set up a congressional uh, committee uh, searching out communists in the government. And Eisenhower said, uh, my cabinet members have been called to testify and you're not going to see them. They don't have to testify and I claim executive privilege. And actually, when Eisenhower said that, that was the first use of the term executive privilege. Then Nixon, six times he claimed executive privilege, all of them related to the Watergate break-in, which was a group uh, of uh, Nixon uh, thieves who broke into Democratic headquarters. They wanted to steal papers about the 1972 election and what the Democratic strategy would be. And there were six times Nixon refused to uh, release information uh, based on executive privilege. Ronald Reagan did it three times. Uh, there, there were uh, protests at Kent State University in Ohio, and four students were killed by the military. Uh, there was a National Guard and, and uh, Justice uh, Rehnquist uh, nomination. Congress asked for some papers. And Nixon's Watergate scandal, will you please finally release some of this information? And in all three cases, Reagan claimed executive privilege. Uh, Clinton uh, did it twice. Uh, there was a Whitewater investment in his home state. He and his wife had invested in a company called Whitewater, and it became quite scandalous what the company was doing with these investments. And uh, Congress asked Clinton to talk to him, give him papers about this Whitewater investment scandal, and he refused. And then the Monica Lewinsky uh, sexual affair, and uh, Clinton refused to release papers, eventually did some testimony about it. Obama once, uh, weapons were being sold, uh, manufactured by the United States government, sold to private citizens who then sold them to foreign countries. <coughs> and um, Congress wanted papers on that and uh, Obama refused. Donald Trump, uh, Somebody someday might count how many times he's <clears throat> claimed executive privilege uh, under a tremendous number of reasons, uh, most prominently the January 6th uh, Capitol uh, invasion where uh, it's estimated about 3,000 protesters <clears throat> entered the U.S. Capitol building, <clears throat> excuse me, and did a lot of damage. When we uh, tally this up, the Republicans have 16 claims of executive privilege, plus however many Trump has made. The Democrats have a total of four. The independents have uh, one, and that was, uh, the independent was George Washington. Uh, executive privilege in the U.S. Constitution is uh, considered and referred to legally as communications privilege. 
And it was, as I said, it was Eisenhower that started calling it executive privilege. Let's read Article 2, Section 3. We'll start right there. Uh, he shall from time to time give to Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in case of disagreement between them with respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all the officers of the United States. So this talks about what the president can, can do. Uh, you're going to have to tell Congress about the State of the Union. Uh, you're going to have to talk to them about measures that... Uh, are looking real necessary, uh, need some attention, and right away, you can call Congress together. You can make for special sessions, or you can adjourn them if you wish. Uh, and you can try to resolve issues that might arise between the different houses of Congress, the Senate and the House. And you're the guy that ambassadors can talk to, uh, foreign affairs stuff, uh, make sure that laws, U.S. laws are enforced, executed properly, etc. Now, in light of these responsibilities of the president, out of that has come this communications privilege. And that means you don't have to communicate. It's executive privilege. Here's some political cartoons concerning executive privilege, uh, uh, now used regularly, uh, I guess, uh, compared to you know the 150 years between Jefferson and Eisenhower. But over the last 75, we've seen lots of this. Here's Nixon. He's in trouble, and uh, the caption is, therefore, I have decided to invoke executive privilege and forgive myself. And we have heard Donald Trump say he becomes president. He can uh, declare himself immune from all punishment. Uh, he has also said that uh, he can pardon all the people who have been convicted on the January 6th uh, insurrection. Here's Obama. Uh, there's Congress, is this individual. There's Obama holding up a sheet that says executive privilege. The caption is, okay, move along. No incriminating documents to see. Come on, show's over. And uh, again, this is about uh, the sale of weapons manufactured by the United States to individuals who then sold them to other countries. The, the whole situation is we were supporting rebels in a variety of different places. And here's a Donald Trump. He's saying, I assert my divine right. And there's Bill Barr, his attorney behind him, saying executive privilege not divine right. Uh, some of the things that uh, are included in these 98 felony charges against Trump are, there are some rape trials or several women that have accused him of rape. There are civil trials. Uh, what about his children testifying? Uh, can they testify against their father? There's gonna be felony trials. He uh, says, I don't have to go to him. I won't be there. Uh, he's then told that he has to show up and has to a couple that have begun. Uh, there are secret documents that were placed out in public view, shown to others, 
had them sitting out in public places at his Mar-a-Lago uh, estate in Florida, et cetera. Okay, back to Jefferson, who used executive privilege uh, in order to tell con uh, a court of law that he was not willing to testify. And let's talk about Burr's Western Empire and the Louisiana Territory. Uh, two arguments were made in Burr's defense. Number one, uh, how could he be violating or causing trouble with Spain on the border between the Louisiana Purchase and Spanish territory when the border has never been uh, determined? I mean, it's unknown. You know, here we go. Looks great. You got a lines and so on, but it's never really been laid out, surveyed, etc. These borders that we see on this map here had not been established in 1803. They weren't established yet in 1805. <clears throat> so how can you accuse Burr of violating borders? when the borders are unknown. Uh, Jefferson stated, common assumption among, among people at the time was that this Louisiana purchase area would become a separate nation, not part of the United States. Uh, well, that's not what happened, probably not the intent, but uh, all of a sudden, it's not a part of the United States, it's territory, and we're going to make it into a separate nation. Uh, the, the Judge Hay, whose picture I showed uh, several slides ago, he was the deciding factor in Burr's trial. It was not a jury. And he declared Burr to be not guilty of any of these charges against him. Uh, and in his decision, Hay stated that uh, the men that Burr had with him were not military in nature. They were wearing civilian clothes, and of course, they were carrying guns. I mean, you have to defend yourself. You have to get food to eat, et cetera. Uh, and, that, and further, Hay said, Jefferson's involvement in this whole situation uh, dates back to his difficulties with Burr over the last few years. So not guilty. Here's a review of what we've talked about. Burr refused to accept the vice presidency in the 1801 election. It went into the House. Jefferson's declared the president. Then Burr has a duel with Hamilton, which is outlawed in many areas, but not in New Jersey. That shines very negative. Number one, he's given up a deal that he made. Number two, he duels. Uh, number three, he supported the secession of six New England states who were talking about it because they didn't like what the federal government was doing. And uh, finally, uh, his takeover attempt of the Louisiana Territory. Uh, Burr's Western Empire, Blenderhassett family. Remember, they lived on that island in the Ohio River where it flows through the state of West Virginia. What consequences did the Blenderhassett family with their $50,000 donation to Burr, what consequences did they face? On uh, Blenderhassett Island, here is the mansion where the family uh lived uh, and they gave the fifty thousand dollars they had the conversations with burr uh, the virginia militia when this all becomes known they move into this island and uh, take over the island and this homestead that you see pictured here Uh, Harmon Blender Hassett, here he is on a miniature, they're called miniatures, something 
that you can wear around your neck. You would give it to your wife. You'd have one of your wife's. You'd wear it around your neck or keep it in a pocket. And they were small in size. And <clears throat> well, he's arrested. But then he's almost immediately released. After a while, he's arrested again, and he's kept in jail for several months. He's never charged. This is amazing in light of the U.S. Constitution. Today, the uh, Supreme Court is, has decided, you know, you uh, you got to charge somebody with a crime. You can't just hold them in jail for several days, several months. You got to do it within 72 hours. Well, he's never charged with anything, so he's released. He moves to the state of Mississippi, where he sets up a plantation, grows cotton. Uh, he then moves to Canada, and he becomes a Canadian lawyer. After Canada, he moves to England. Uh, now, he's not actually on the island of England. He's in the English Channel. And he moves to Guernsey, which is a part of England. And here's Jersey, another part of England. You can see they're very close to the French coast here. During World War II, the Germans took over Jersey Island. There's an excellent little movie about what life was like during the uh, German conquest of Jersey for all of the British who didn't get off the island uh, once the war had begun. And uh, it's on Guernsey Island here where Blenderhassett uh, dies. Uh, the James Wilkinson case, remember? He was the governor. He was a military guy. He was the governor of uh, Louisiana Territory, talking to Burr, talking to Jefferson, playing them against each other. Let's talk about him. There are five concerns about uh, Wilkinson, Army General, Governor of Louisiana Territory. Number one, did he side with Burr? Was he talking to Burr? What was, uh, what kind of contact did they have? Uh, he accepted 12,000 pesos from the Spanish. This is information about where the border should be as what was suspected. Uh, 12,000 pesos in uh, 2022 by inflation, that's about $15,000. So this is kind of a bribe to uh, benefit the Spanish when a borderline is established and drawn for Louisiana territory. Thirdly, Jefferson takes no action against him. This gets up to be 1806. Uh, Wilkinson is a friend. Uh, Jefferson really liked the guy, so no action taken. House of Representatives, however, takes a different view, and they investigate him. And they uh, release a paper that says, we can't find anything he did that was wrong. So then the military investigates him. Remember, he's an army general serving as governor of Louisiana Territory. In 1808, they say no evidence of misconduct. He's fine. So he escapes all punishment for talking to the Spanish, playing Burr and Jefferson against each other. Cleared by the executive branch, cleared by the legislative branch, cleared by the military. Then in 1854, there's uh, a guy from the United States digging around in Spanish archives in Spain, and he finds multiple payments made by Spain to Wilkinson. Here's a letter that Wilkinson uh, uh, wrote to Jefferson, <clears throat> and the drawings are copies of images in stone uh, that Native Americans had out in Louisiana territory. Um, so it's just, it's a, shows you that there's a, 
handwriting and letters that uh, Wilkinson had written. Now, in Spain, in the Spanish archives, this investigator from the U.S. who's just working on his own in the 1850s sees that <coughs> Wilkinson is referred to in Spanish documents as Agent 13. Teddy Roosevelt said of Wilkinson, in all our history, there has been no more despicable a character. Yet uh, by the 1850s now, then it had become quite obvious that Wilkinson was working with the Spanish against his uh, home nation of the United States. Uh, Raymond Burr, the actor. Okay, we got Aaron Burr. Here's Raymond Burr. Uh, notable role was uh, Perry Mason series on TV that ran for several years. Guess what? No relationship to Aaron Burr. The inauguration, uh, not in attendance. Adams did not attend Jefferson's inauguration. There was a lot of tension between these two guys. They were in regular conflict with each other. And uh, most recently, uh, Donald Trump did not attend the Biden inaugural proclaiming a fake election. And uh, Adams, of course, had lost the 1800 election to Jefferson didn't like what Jefferson was going to be doing, had no interest in attending that inauguration. Here are four presidents who did not attend the inauguration of their predecessor. Uh, John Adams, 1801, did not like Thomas Jefferson. Adams was a Federalist, wanted a strong federal government. Jefferson was just the opposite. John Quincy Adams in uh, 1829 uh, did not attend the inauguration of Andrew Jackson. The major issue in the campaign, uh, presidential campaign of 1828 between uh, J.Q. Adams and Jackson was secret societies within the United States. Adams was opposed to them. Andrew Jackson was a Mason, and uh, that was the issue. And uh, Adams was not about ready to attend the inauguration of a person who was a member of a secret society in a democracy. Andrew Johnson, 1869 inauguration of Ulysses Grant. Johnson did not attend it. Uh, Johnson wanted Southern states and the individuals involved in the Civil War to be free and go forward, come on back into the country, your citizens again. Ulysses Grant said no. And Grant, through his eight years, supported Reconstruction. Reconstruction meant we're going to educate Black people. We are going to allow jobs for people of color. Uh, Howard University was founded where in Washington, D.C., where our former slaves could attend college. Uh, Grant was doing all sorts of things to try to make uh, slaves citizens. Uh, Johnson was more opposed to that. Of course, uh, Grant's uh, purposes all came to a halt in 1876 uh, when the Republican Party made a deal with the South that uh, won them the election that year and uh, led to another 90 to 100 years, basically, of Jim Crow laws, a continuation of slavery. So it was that was about the Civil War and what would happen with the rights of former slaves. And Andrew Johnson, as a result, did not attend the Ulysses Grant inauguration. 
And Donald Trump in 2021, the 2020 election went to Joe Biden. Trump called it a fake election. I was, it was cheated. And uh, consequently, I'm not attending the Biden inauguration. So we've had four presidents refusing to attend the inauguration of their predecessor. And we went from 1869, this is a, to 2021, a period of near uh, over 150 years uh, where outgoing presidents attended the inauguration of their successor. Uh, Jefferson, his first inauguration. Let's take a look. He rode a horse to the inauguration. People expected him to ride in a carriage. Uh, that would have been far more becoming of his status. Uh, walking is the best possible exercise. Habituate yourself to walk very far. Quote from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, other people say, he didn't ride a horse to his inauguration. He walked to it. And here's uh, Jefferson commenting on walking. Now, what's amazing is the hotel Jefferson was staying at was one block from the United States Capitol building where his inauguration took place. You could have easily walked it. Uh, really, you certainly didn't need a horse or a carriage. At any rate, it's amazing what we get upset about. First inauguration was at the U.S. Capitol. This is the Capitol building in 1801. It wasn't until 1859 that a Senate chamber was added on and a House chamber was added on. The Senate and the House met in rooms inside this much smaller building. Today, this building has been easily tripled in size with a Senate and a House chamber on each side of it, connected to it. It's kind of like the White House had no West Wing. The West Wing wasn't built till 1909, and that provided uh, space for uh, the press it provided space for the uh, the president to have an office, the Oval Office. Lots of his advisors have space in there. So that, that really made a big difference also. But the first inauguration of Jefferson was at the Capitol building shown here. And you can see it's not huge. Look at the carriages and the people and by comparison. Uh, equal justice for all men. There were three major points in his first inaugural address. Um, so equal justice for all men. Uh, women were not included in this remark. Slaves were not included. Slave men, certainly. Slave women, not included. Uh, second of three major points. The rights of minorities are guaranteed. And by this, he meant religious groups and spoke about Quakers, Catholics, and, and immigrants, people that were here for the first time. On, and that's non-religious. Uh, slaves are never mentioned as a minority that gets rights. And third, uh, freedom of speech freedom of press, and freedom of religion, all First Amendment stuff. And Jefferson was very much in favor of these uh, three items uh, and emphasized them in this first inaugural address. White House customs. Uh, Jefferson uh, did not wear uh, street clothes. Generally, I mean, all day he would be in a nightshirt, uh, as this fellow that's pictured here. He'd have socks and slippers and a nightshirt. And uh, 
you know, there weren't people that answered the front door at the White House yet. Sometimes somebody, some employee did, but Jefferson would often hear people knocking on the front door of the White House. He'd go to the White House, open the door in his nightshirt. Hi, how's it going? He's wearing bedclothes. Uh, this is reported by many people. Visitors reported it to newspapers. Slaves reported it to people interviewing them, the slaves who worked in the White House. Uh, family members of Jefferson's even uh, talked about how he stayed away from uh, street clothes uh, when he was at home. And home, of course, included the White House. Shocking. Uh, no other presidents have initiated or maintained the custom of wearing night clothes all day and publicly. Uh, Washington and John Adams, uh, they would buy somebody come to the White House to visit, you would bow to them as they did with the English king. So there'd be a slight bow from the president and a deeper bow from the guests who were attending. Uh, Jefferson started handshaking at the, when you came to the uh, White House, don't bow, uh, put your right hand out, I'll shake it. And this is a custom that began with Jefferson and exists to the present day. Here is Donald Trump. Uh, twice uh, photos of him shaking hands with Putin. What's interesting about this is he talks about Russia and how he doesn't like them. Some Republicans criticized Obama for shaking hands with a dictator. And uh, now here we have a Republican president who was shaking hands with uh, a Russian. Um, how are we doing for questions? We've got two questions, and I think they will probably be pretty brief. So if you want to go a few more slides, I think we can probably go until 155. Okay, why don't I finish this section, and Sounds then we'll uh, do the questions. Good, thanks. First actions as presidents. Uh, Jefferson did quite a bit. He did a lot of undoing of his predecessors. There's a total of 10 items. You know, this is kind of a lengthy section. I think uh, let's quit. Uh, frequently other questions will come in. If they don't, we will just simply uh, quit early. So uh, I'd say let's uh, go ahead and do questions. And now, there, there we go. Thanks. Yeah. So we can start with uh, a quick one. Is one of the viewers is asking what the name of the movie that you mentioned about Jersey Island in England during World War II. Yeah, and I can't remember. I shouldn't have brought it up unless I put it down there. And I can try to post it or look it up for next week. Um, it's an interesting movie. Uh, they have uh, teenagers on bicycles that are delivering messages uh, between uh British uh, units or, uh, or people that are stayed on the island, you know, and they uh, they have people building walls there, and uh, their women are heavily involved, and and so on. And um, yeah, I just uh, I can't recall the name of it. Sorry. No worries. We can add that to next week's. Uh... Yeah, point, maybe. Um, the next question is regarding the state's rights versus federal power. What was Jefferson's approach to free enterprise versus government control? Well, he number one, he didn't like uh, corporations. Uh, he ended up supporting some of them. He thought that the United States had to maintain an agricultural lifestyle. He felt that democracy could not exist uh, in a corporate state. Democracy can only exist with uh, small farmers. 
and that, you know, 90% of the population should be uh, farmers uh, owning their own property. And that was a requirement for voting. Uh, you had to be a male over 21 who owns property. So anybody renting an apartment today wouldn't be allowed to vote in Jefferson's time. Um, so Jefferson was, uh, you know, maintenance of an agricultural system. Uh, the Republican par Party, uh, you know, was the party that ended up becoming very much tied to corporations. They were founded in 1854 after the Civil War. Uh, the Industrial Revolution really bloomed in the United States. And of course, uh, Jefferson's, part of Jefferson's uh, complaint never stated, but uh, corporations are top-down organizations. Or we could say they're dictatorships. I mean, the people working there are generally and 99% uh, of corporations don't vote on what the corporation can or can't do. They don't determine what their salaries are, uh, et cetera. Um, so the, the, the notion of comparing a company with a democracy, it doesn't fit in Jefferson's mind. And what we need is uh, families, individuals, that go ahead and uh, maintain an agricultural system. And he contends democracy will simply disappear if we go in any other direction. And we'll talk more about that in the over the next four weeks too, so. Uh, the next question is, did Jefferson consider himself to be a small farmer? Oh, <laughs> Well, that's an interesting thing. It's kind of a hypocrisy in a sense, because here we have a guy that owns 600 slaves, hundreds of acres of land. Uh, he's a big business. He's a corporation. He's not a small farmer. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and we'll be talking over the next four weeks about... Um, what a lot of historians say is the hypocrisy of Jefferson, and that is saying one thing, but actually being something quite different from that. So Jefferson may have seen himself as a farmer, but he never pulled a weed. And, uh, so the next question is, was there any history of handshaking anywhere previous to Jefferson? Oh, yes. He didn't invent it. Uh, and I don't know what the history of handshaking is. Um, I can tell you this much. It grew out of military meetings. And you would walk up to your opponents and you would hold out your hand, showing that you have no weapon in your hand. And uh, you would shake hands with them. Um, there, so you know, I my guess is this probably started in the Middle Ages during negotiations between uh, groups of military people. And uh, same thing is true about uh, today. When we have a drink, we click glasses, you know, click the glasses together, and that's a sign of, hey, thanks. In the Middle Ages, they would hold up the glass, and it would have wine or beer in it, and you wouldn't click it. You'd dump part of yours into your opponent's. He would dump part of his back into yours. That was an indication that you were not being poisoned because you were both now drinking of the same mixed beverage. Whereas uh, uh, once, uh, once that went away as a problem, uh, the clicking of the glasses uh, has been maintained. 
quite an interesting fact. I didn't know that. That's that's cool. Yeah. Um, what was the ending like for Aaron Burr? How did Burr end up? And I know that it's not too great. Uh, could you say it again? What was sure the the question is what was the ending like for Aaron Burr, and oh. how did Burr end up? Hmm. I'll look it up for next week. Where did Burr? Let's see. I want to write this down. Burr, Burr's later life and end of life and the Jersey movie. And we actually have a few um, that have submitted the name of the movie, and I believe it's called the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. That uh, that, right? Yep, that sounds right. Thanks. Uh, say it again too for people sure the name of the movie is the guernsey literary and potato peel pie society thanks hope to see everyone next week all right we'll see everybody then thanks jb thank you